The promises of God are commitments God has made to mankind. There are several thousand promises in the Bible, and they deal with every aspect of our lives. Today, my father, Dr. Lester Sumrall, explores some of the dramatic, life-changing statements God has made that are backed up by his integrity. Stay tuned as this great biblical study into the promises of God will awaken faith and joy in your life. The promises of God, very clearly one of the most important subjects of the Word of God. There are more than 7,000 precise, precious promises in the Bible. These were made by God to man. In today's teaching time with Dr. Lester Sumrall, we will be looking at the many facets of these glittering diamonds of truth. Some are startling, others breathtaking. Now, here is Dr. Lester Sumrall. I don't know anyone that, have take, that has taken so much time studying the promises of God as we have. We are now at lesson 25 in studying just the promises of God. And we felt like it would be beautiful to break in at this point and <laughs> let you know that God's still making promises. I mean, to believe that. God can make commitments to you. God can say things to you, and they will come to pass. Tell the devil I said so, please. They will come to pass. I believe in the promises of God. I receive and accept the promises of God. There are many full gospel uh, and, and fundamental groups today that are moving back a little and saying maybe so related to the promises of God and especially the miracles of God and especially the power of faith to bring them back. Now listen, uh, it's the power of faith that does create and you better have faith in God or you won't have anything. Uh, it's faith in God that creates the miracles of God. Lord, I believe and I trust and they do come to pass. We believe that this is the hour of miracle and not just in science. And, and not just in political areas of, of atomic bombs and, and then not in just the medicinal area of, of, of medicine, but in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the hour of miracle. And we will not settle for any less. We're going to believe God for all of the great promises. And all the people said, I desire with all my heart uh, for you to become what I will call promise conscious and that we'll do it only from the Word of God. I have discovered that in every major crisis of my life, the promises of God has been exactly what directed me at that moment of time, when I could not rely on that which is normal or, or natural or, or, or physical. Uh, then I discovered that God's Word was a leader, was a guide, and was a helper in that time of need. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I have never taken the Bible and tried to use it in any magic formula. Uh, I haven't sought to try to find God's Word and, and urge God to talk to me uh, by taking the Bible and letting it fall open and say, hey, that's mine. Or it would have been like it did right then, fall open in the concordance. Then you'd have had a lot of it on your hand. You see, I, I have never done that. I have never even taken the little promise box and say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll take mo. I, I, I have never done that. But God has uh, spoken to me uh, through his word. And I want to give you some instances of it. I was dying of tuberculosis in both my lungs when I was from 16 into my 17th year. And one night the doctor said that I would be dead in two hours. Told my family that. And that night, I made a commitment to God that if he would let me live, I would preach his word. And that night, God healed me of tuberculosis. I have had no sign of tuberculosis in my body from that day until this day. I was wonderfully, gloriously healed. When you start out like that, it's hard to get you on another road. When you begin in miracle, it, it's, it, it's mighty hard to go back and take something you know, average and uh, human and has to do with this world. When you begin in miracle, you love to stay up there or you want to take it a step further and make it a super. Can you say amen? My earthly father told me he did not want me to go and preach and my heavenly father said he did and I was in a bitter conflict between the two. 
And God spoke to me as I laid on the floor weeping before him and said, you read Isaiah 41, 10, and 11. And I opened the Bible. I did not know what it was. And God said to me, fear thou not, I am with thee. I want to tell you from the depths of my being that at that moment, God took fear out of my life. And if my life has been dominated by anything, any one element from that moment to this, it's that verse of Scripture that when a problem came, God said, Fear thou not, I am with you. And I don't have to fear because I have the knowledge of the presence of God along with whatever I'm doing, and I don't have to have fear. He said, Be not dismayed, I will be your God. And uh, when I thought of Moses and Abraham and Joseph, I said, hey, he's not a bad God to have along with you, you know. He is a mighty deliverer. He says, I will strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness, and all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed, and be sure confounded, they shall be as nothing, and they that strive with you shall perish. It is impossible uh, at this moment to describe to you the blending of the human and the divine in that spiritually illuminating moment when the holy, invigorating power of God was turning a boy into a man and turning a, a poor little creature just healed into a minister of the gospel. God was doing it. It only took him a while to do it. I got up off that floor, and within two hours' time, I went out to minister uh, the gospel of Jesus, and I have never moved back from it. I have never slowed down with it. I have never quit. Uh, someone asked me uh, this week, says, do you ever take a vacation? And I said, well, that's all I'm on is a vacation. I'm sure that now you're telling me going to make me work because I've lived on a vacation so long. And uh, I may have to work for you over there to make up for all the vacation I've had. Someone asked me this morning, says, uh, uh, do you, you feel invigorated? I said, yeah, I don't see why three meetings a day wouldn't make a person feel invigorated. Uh, is a uh, his throat might be a little, a little haggard, you know. But anyway, if you're working for the Lord, it's glorious. And if you're seeing people converted to Jesus every time you stand up, it's wonderful. And if you see the miraculous hand of God laid upon people's lives and their change, there just isn't any greater vacation in the universe. God is great. And if you know it, say amen. It was from that first opening of the Word of God to me personally that charted my life in its course from that moment until this. Now, the Lord spoke to us in, in different ways at different times, but these are very particular moments. Three years after that one, uh, I was in San Francisco, and I was on my way around the world to be a missionary at 20 years of age. I, I had not asked any denomination to uh, support me or to help me. I hadn't told them I was going. I knew what they'd say. They'd say, wait until you grow up. I didn't have time for that. And so I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't ask any church to help me. In those days, churches weren't helping anybody that I ever heard of. I didn't know anything about it if they were. And so I had 12 $1 bills in my pocket, and I was headed around the world. And I kind of got the feeling, you know, when the boat was about ready to leak, that when, I, when, they, when, they, when they pulled back those horses there, from across the dock, and that boat was separated into the harbor, and we pushed out to sea. I was fairly well on my own, just me and Jesus. And uh, my, my, my eyes began to, to have little drops of rain, and uh, some of the people there felt sorry for me on the boat. One lady said, poor little thing, he hadn't been away from home before. That upset me. But anyway, I, I finally got over it. But the Lord spoke to me and, and said, I, 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 have, uh, I have something for you. And, uh, and, he, and he gave it to me. He said, uh, in John 15 and 16 is my word to you. And I didn't know what it was at the moment. But I opened my testament and it said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Now, uh, when you're 20 years old and you have no sustenance outside of God whatsoever, 
and God speaks to you that way, it's overwhelming. He said, you've not chosen me. Immediately, my whole being went back through my life, and I said, yeah, I, I can see I didn't do much of the choosing. I, I'm just preaching to stay alive is all, uh, because I didn't want to die of tuberculosis. So it must have been your choice. It sure wasn't mine. And, and this missionary thing, it came because of a vision I'd seen of the world going to hell, and so that wasn't my choice either. I said, I can see when these scriptures came to me, these promises of God, I almost felt like God had sneaked them into the Bible the night before and that nobody else knew anything about them. And I want to tell you something. When I hear other people read them, I say, shh, don't read that. That's mine. You know, I, I really felt it was personal for me. And even until today, there are certain scriptures of other people reading. I said, you know, they shouldn't read that. You know, they're, they're reading my part. But the Bible is so living until God can make any part of it alive just for you, and you'll think it was never for anybody else but you. Can you say amen? And so I took that scripture and stood on it two and a half years and in Australia. We linked up with Brother Howard Carter, and we went along together. But for two and a half years, as we moved every day around the world, God supplied my needs supernaturally. He supplied my needs through uh, Javanese people, uh, he supplied my needs through Chinese people, through uh, Japanese people, uh, through all kinds of people around the world, and not one of them ever knew that I had a need. You see, that was the amazing part. And even Mr. Carter, that I traveled with, we never divulged to each other any needs that we had. And so he had no idea of any of my needs. And I didn't have any idea of his needs. I had to pray for him every day, Lord, supply his needs. Lord, supply his needs. And I'd say, I'll take the leftovers, Lord. You know me too, don't you? But he made it, and I made it. And, and God said, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. I've ordained you. That word ordained means anointed. I've anointed you that you should go. I said, hey, hey, no doubt about that. I'm going. And you shall bring forth fruit. <laughs> if there's anything in the world that will, that will get you down is, is to go and preach somewhere and nobody gets saved. I, I go and try to raise up a church and nobody will come to it. He said, you shall bring forth fruit. And I've stood on that. I, when I speak, I say, fruit, come. Don't you, don't you come slow either. Get out of there. Because I have a promise that you come. And I command it to come. I teach any kind of a class anywhere in the world and get souls saved. God, God says, I have fruit. And I command the fruit to come. And it says, the fruit shall remain. Maybe that's the best part of it. Now, there are people that have revival meetings. And three weeks later, you can't find any of the revival. It's all dissipated. It's, it's finished. It's gone. But... Anywhere that we let down on the face of this earth, we leave a body there. We leave a church there. We leave a group there. And they're there. They don't, they don't die. They don't dissipate. They don't go away. They're there. They remain. And it isn't because I am great. It's simply because God promised it. And if God promised it, his promises are true. That's the main part we're trying to put across to our class, that whatever God says is true. And he says, whatsoever yes, the Father in my name, he will give it to you. <coughs> So these are promises that God made to me, and they have become living words that live in my total being. And, and I don't just repeat them for you. I repeat them every day. I go back through these promises and say, Lord, you made this to me, didn't you? And you're going to live up to it, aren't you? You know, it's a great way to live. It's a great way to live. That's better than Wall Street. They go up and down like a yo-yo, and God is stable. If you know it, say amen. A scripture God gave to me that I possibly shouldn't go overlook uh, because uh, some of you are young and, uh, and you know what it means to be hurt when you're young. When I was about 18 and a half and maybe getting close to 19, uh, none of my family had seen me. I'd been off on my own in little country schoolhouses and it's hard to find when you're going from schoolhouse to schoolhouse without an address. Uh, but I went to visit my oldest brother. His name was Houston. And, of course, he's a big shot. He had a church, and he was going well, and he didn't want to come out and hear his little kid brother preach in the country on, I, I, I believe it was the brush arbor that I was preaching on another church building. So he told his wife, he says, go and, go and listen to Lester preach and come back and tell me about it. Well, I just assumed she'd have stayed at home, but anyway, she, she came along. And, and she didn't fit too well into my country congregation. You know, city dudes and good country people don't, you know, don't look the same in church. And, and so I was up there preaching way to my country folk, and here was this city lady 
sit on the front seat. If she'd have sat on the back, I'd appreciated it, but she didn't. She sat on the front seat, and you could tell she was from the city. And you could tell my rest of my congregation was from the country. I mean, that was no problem. But anyway, I didn't do too well that night. If she hadn't have been there, I'd have done a lot better. But anyway, uh, yeah. how many love your kin folks? <laughs> Takes a lot of going sometimes. Uh, anyway, we got back to their house, and, and you, you know, they lived up kind of up north a little bit, and they have these uh, air things like we have here, you know, uh, where the air comes into the different rooms. And they are also echo chambers. How many already knew that? I mean, that's where you peep on one another. And listen, see what they're saying in the next room. And so I, I, they were in the next bedroom to me, and I heard my brother with his preacher's voice said, uh, he called her baby doll, says, baby doll, how did he do? Well, he meant me, you know, and she called him Bud. Uh, she says, Bud, he wouldn't make it in a thousand years. I heard it, you know, and I began to cry. Because I was feeling she was right about the thing, only I didn't feel like I was going to make it for the whole thousand, you know. Uh, it's a long time. And, and, and I began to cry. Lying on the floor, I wouldn't, when I, and I get upset, I don't mess with bed, see. I get on the floor where I belong. And I went, laid on the floor, and I began to cry. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you read Luke 4 and 18. Now, I know Jesus spoke those words, and I know they were real in his ministry, but they became real to me that night about midnight. It really became real to me. The Lord said these words. He said, the spirit of Jehovah is upon me. And I, I looked at it and I said, are you real sure, Lord? Yeah. And my my sister-in-law in that other room, she don't think you're anywhere close to me at all. Says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And I said, I don't like it. I've been out there preaching those poor farmers. I don't. God said, that's not the kind of poor I'm talking about. Isn't it nice that the Lord stopped you and talked to you a little bit? He said, everyone that doesn't know me is poor throughout the whole world. They're poor. And everyone that doesn't have the riches of my glory, they're poor. Oh, I said, I see it, Lord. I'll, I'll sure talk to those folks. I mean, I'll, I'll be glad to anywhere in the world talk to those folks. To preach the gospel to those that haven't heard, those that don't have anything, and those that don't know the great truths of God. You would be amazed at this, just this last week, of how many hundreds of, of people that we preached to that were well off in this world's goods, but they were poor when it come to the knowledge of God. And they came to the knowledge of the, of the gifts of the Spirit, came to the knowledge of the total man. Uh, that they, they sat with their mouths open, wanted to learn stuff that was so simple to me, I, I give it to you while I sleep almost. And, and here they, they were living right here in our country and knew nothing about it at all. Sometimes we judge a whole nation by ourselves, you know, because you know so much, you say, well, everybody knows it. And sometimes you say, why don't Brother Sumrall talk on something else? Well, let's wait till we all learn what we're talking about first. Well, he shall preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And, and, and I want that to always lay right there in my bosom. To preach deliverance to the captives. Now, that's my style right there. I love to preach deliverance to those that are under the captivity of the devil and command them to be set free, forever free. Can you say amen? The recovering of sight to the blind. How beautiful it is. And to set at liberty those that are bruised. And I said, Lord, is that my ministry? And the Lord says, that is your ministry. And I live by that verse of Scripture. I minister by that verse of Scripture. That verse of Scripture becomes a life and a pattern that I walk by. What we want you to see in, in this class today is that God speaks to you through his word. And that God not only spoke to Isaiah, but God not only spoke to Simon Peter, God speaks to you. Are you believe me or not? That God's talking to you from his word and his promises are divine and his promises are real and his promises can't go away. They are yours. And uh, I just want to thank God that we've got a little time behind us here that we can say, now, he's been doing this for 50 years. You know, he didn't just get started yesterday. He's been doing it all the time, and that we're so glad for it. Can you say amen? I presume the next time that I was spoken to by the Lord uh, was uh, like a year and a half after we left uh, uh, California, and we were in Tibet, 
Uh, we had gone through New Zealand and Australia and Java and Singapore and Hong Kong. And we were way up near the bank of Tibet, up there preaching to tribes people and comforting missionaries. There were German missionaries up there that we visited. There were Scandinavian missionaries up there that we visited. There were American missionaries up there. There were, there were Australian missionaries. And they never saw a visitor. They never had anybody to preach to them. Well, who wanted to ride a mule for three months to get to preach to somebody, you know? You had your right mind. And so we went up and ministered to them and preached to them and, and saw hundreds of people saved up there. But we also got captured by bandits. We had 17 mules in our caravan and we were, we were going across the mountains to preach and we got captured by three men. They put their guns behind our heads, made us get off our mules and walk. One old guy, I, I was in the front, he uh, took his gun and had it about that far at the back of my head. And I kept thinking, if, if that guy stumps his toe, I'm in trouble back there, you know? And, and he just walked along there with that thing behind my head and I was walking in front of him and I got so tired of that gun, I didn't know what to do. And, and finally I said, Lord, did I come up here to die? And the Lord said, no. Well, I said, it looks like it from the back of me here. Uh, that was a place of blood and killing up in that part of the world. And uh, I said, if I didn't come up here to die, would you just let him move that gun? He's been there for three hours. My knees are weak. And <laughs> <coughs> if I were to stumble, he might shoot me for it. And I said, uh, I'd like for him to, to, to move the gun. And, and, and as I did, the Lord spoke to me and said, your promise is in the Revelation 19 and 6. And I didn't know what it was. Each time the Lord gave me these I never knew what they were. So I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out my little testament while I was still walking, opened it up to Revelation 19 and 6, and it says, And I heard the voice of a great multitude. I heard the voice of many waters. And I heard the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Who I said that? He reigns? The Lord said, Sure, I reign. Well, I said, If you reign, he don't. He just thinks he does. And I got so happy, I turned around and laughed in his face. <laughs> just turned around and laughed. I don't know whether he thought I had gone crazy, but a Chinese cannot be laughed at. They, they, they lose face. And when I did, he just dropped the gun over his arm like that down toward the ground and was looking at me. And I said, what do you want? <laughs> My interpreter said, the white face says, what do you want? And he says, I need money. In that moment, one of our dollars brought 2,500 of theirs. We didn't carry it in our pockets. We carried it in boxes. And so we said, get in the box and give him some money. So he went to the box and gave him a load of money. And I said, what else do you want? He said, we're hungry. On another mule, we had it full of food. He said, open up the, the food. Give the man food. And, and, and we gave him food. And I said, what else do you want? And he couldn't think of anything. I said, then you get over there out of my way. I'm going to ride out of here. You know, God can give you something that I didn't even have a pocket knife. That man had a gun, you know. Uh, but if the Lord reigns, he reigns. If he's in charge, he's in charge. And no matter what the other fellow thinks he's got, if, if God says it, the promises of God are real, and I've lived on them, and I want you to know that. And I want you to understand that. I'm sure that those Chinese had a story to tell when they got home. I'm sure they did. Because when we got into that mud village to spend the night, the whole village was trembling. Many people had been killed on the trail that day. And uh, the armies were all broken up and running, and killing anybody they wanted to. And they asked if we had been accosted. They said several groups had already lost their lives that day. And we said, we saw three men with guns, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't hurt us. They shook their head and said, you are the chief and the best thing on the road. You've got more than anybody else on the road. You've even got folding cots to sleep on, and these men sleep on the ground. And, and said, you've got covers, and they don't have any covers. And you've got food, and you've got money, and you've got animals. It says, they needed everything you had. But I said, but God said, <laughs> but, God, but God said, he reigns, and he's my God. And they couldn't bother us. The, the, the town wanted to listen to what we had to say because we had come through abandoned infested territory and God had preserved us. Now, that's what I mean about the promises of God. 
How many want the promises of God to get real to you? You got to quote them. <laughs> they got, you got to talk about them. I've heard that there's 7,000 of them in the Bible. 7,000 of them. If that's so, read them and believe them and accept them. And all the people said, you're sitting in a building today uh, that is a, a, a miracle building because I wanted to put my headquarters in Los Angeles or in San Francisco or in New York or in Washington. I did not want my headquarters to be in the center of the nation when I came back from the mission field. And a little lady that's sitting right back here this morning came to my house next door said, if you don't raise up a place of deliverance in this city, said, God will send somebody else to do it, and said that you will, for the rest of your life, regret that you didn't do it. And she got to my heart. And I made a little trip into Illinois here with some of my workers, and speaking night by night. And one morning as we, in this, in this motel, I got up, and my room was right next door. I think Brother C.C. Ford was traveling with us, and Brother Murphy was with us, and, and two or three others as we were having these one night stands and uh, I was leaving by my bed and God said you better read Jeremiah 33 and 9 and you better you better bill in South Bend what I tell you to and so when he said that I opened the Jeremiah 33 and 9 and I didn't know what it was at all and God said it shall be a name of joy I said really he said it shall be a name of joy a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth. I said, that's mighty big. Which shall hear of all the good that I shall do and all the prosperity that I shall bring. So as I, as I read it, I said, Lord, I accept your promise. And you're sitting in the midst of prosperity. You're sitting in the midst of a place of joy that even brings joy to God. And you're sitting in a place that the whole world has to know about us. Isn't that something? And there was nothing here. And God said it shall be. If God says it'll be, neighbor, it will be. It don't matter how poor the physical situation is or the natural situation. Spiritually, God can make it to come to pass. If you know it, say amen. The message you have just heard is now available in audio and video. An audio tape is yours for a gift of any amount and a videotape for a gift of $20 or more. Please mention the program number on your screen and communicate with us by phone or mail. I am Peter Sumrall and thanks for watching.